Now the first mechanism of heat transfer I want to talk about is conduction. And really the example we've just looked at is an example of conduction. But if you touch an object which is cold, for example on a cold morning you might touch a metal object, and the heat is transferred directly out of your body into something else. So if the person here touches something which is cold, there's direct contact between the person and the cold object, then the heat can be transferred directly from the warm body into the cold object. This will work whenever objects colder than the surface of the body come into contact with the body surface. Heat will be lost directly by conduction. Now there is a certain amount of heat which is lost by conduction into the air. Not actually very much though, because the air is actually a good insulator of heat. So normally only something like 3% of the total amount of heat loss will be lost by conduction into the air. Now, if a person is immersed in water, the story is very different. Because air is a very good insulator of heat. The air is not transferred from the body out into the air effectively by conduction. So that means even if, so if someone is in air, which is a lot colder than body temperature, even without clothes, they can stay relatively warm. But in water the situation is quite different, because water is a relatively good conductor of heat. So if someone is immersed in cold water, they can lose a lot of body temperature really quite quickly, as the water conducts the heat from the body into the colder water. Interestingly, this is why clothes actually, well, one of the main reasons why clothes keep us warm. Because round about the body, underneath the clothes, between the outside of the body and the clothes, a layer of air is trapped. And because air is a good insulator of heat, not much heat is transferred into the air surrounding the body. So the fact that air is a poor conductor of heat in other words, the air is a good insulator of heat, explains largely why clothes keep us warm. So direct contact, air is a good insulator, but a lot of heat can be lost in, in, in water if we're immersed in cold water. Now, heat loss from evaporation is actually included under this heading of conduction. Now, all the time, of course, we're losing water from the surface of the body. Now, just now I don't feel particularly sweaty, but my skin is actually not exactly, well, yeah, it is leaking. It, there is a cutaneous loss of water from the surface of the uh, from the surface of the body. In plants we would call this transpiration. So you're actually losing some water from the surface of the body all the time. And as the water that's lost onto the surface of the body evaporates, heat is removed from the body during this process. And in fact, about 25% of the amount of heat generated by basal metabolism is lost by this cutaneous loss of water. Of course, when we're very hot, we sweat. Or when we put water on us, that water will dry. Now, what I want to explain now is the concept of the latent heat of vaporization. Now, latent means hidden, and vaporization means the transfer from a liquid state into a vaporous state. So if you think of sweat, when we sweat, liquid water is deposited on the surface of the body. This liquid water will evaporate when it changes into a vapour. In other words, there will be a process of vaporization. But that change from a liquid to a vapour is a very um, energy requiring change. It actually takes a lot of energy to transfer water from being a liquid to being a vapour. Energy is required to facilitate that. And the energy that is required to facilitate that change is extracted from the surface of the body as heat. 
This is why it's called the hidden heat of vaporization, the latent heat of vaporization. It is the heat extracted from the surface of the body in order to allow the vaporization of any liquids which are on the surface of the body. This applies to sweat, water that's actually placed on the surface of the body, and as we've mentioned, cutaneous loss of water. So when we talk about loss of heat by conduction, we mean the direct contact, yes, but we also mean the heat lost during the process of evaporation. So we've looked at conduction, we're now going to look at convection. Now we've already decided that when a molecule is hotter, it's going to be vibrating more vigorously. This is true of air molecules. When the air is hotter, the individual air molecules will be vibrating more vigorously. Now if I'm standing nice and still, people come and stand next to me, and you could get a lot of us in a small space. Lots of people could all fit in this room, and as long as we stand still. But if I start moving around and vibrating like this, in various directions, then can you see if there was someone next to me, I'd bump into them and I'd push them out of the way. And it's exactly the same with air molecules. When the molecules are vibrating more vigorously, they're going to take up more space. Therefore, there will be less air molecules in a particular volume. Therefore, the density of the air will be less. So, as the air warms up, the molecules vibrate more vig vigorously. Because the molecules are vibrating more vigorously, they're taking up more space, and the air is less dense. This is the principle of a hot air balloon. You heat up some air with the burner, the hot air becomes less dense and rises. And because it is less dense than the cold air surrounding the envelope of the balloon, the balloon will rise. Because warm air is less dense than cold air. And it's exactly the same when you think about heat loss from the body. So the body is going to warm up the air round about it, providing of course that the air is cooler than the body, which is very often the case, unless you're in a hot tropical climate. So air round about the body is warmed up. As this air is warmed up, the molecules are going to vibrate more vigorously, therefore the air is going to become less dense. Because the air is less dense, the hot air will float upwards. Away from the body. So the body warms up the air, the air becomes less dense and floats upwards. Now if this air is floating upwards, can you see that as the air moves upwards it's going to leave a partial vacuum round about the body? Now of course that can't be tolerated, so immediately colder air will be drawn in from underneath. So colder air molecules will come in from underneath. These in turn of course will be warmed by the body and will then rise. So the body warms up air next to it which moves away upwards because it's less dense. And this is replaced by denser cold air from underneath. What this means is that you have a flow of heat, a flow of air over the body and the heat which rises is referred to as the transfer of heat by convection. So convection is the movement of heat within the currents, um, the movement of heat in currents within a fluid. You get convection in water, you get it in air as well of course. 
Now I think I'll mention wind chill at this stage as well. If you're in cold air and the air is still, then the air round about the surface of the body is going to warm up and we've already said the air acts as a reasonably good insulator of heat. But if you're in a wind and some air molecules are warmed up, then very quickly those warm mo molecules of air will be blown away and replaced by colder ones in the wind. So wind chill is going to cool the body down because as soon as the body has warmed some air molecules up they're going to be blown away and replaced by colder ones. That's going to increase the temperature differential between the warm body and the cold air and that will cause an accelerated rate of heat conduction from the body into the cold air molecules. Again they're quickly blown away to be replaced by cold ones again. So in cold air especially when there's a wind you're going to get a forced convection. So a wind chill really is a process of forced convection blowing warm molecules of air away from the surface of the body. So remember convection is the movement of currents and flows as a result of warm fluids, in this case air, warm air, being less dense than cold air. So we've just discussed conduction and convection. The third mechanism of heat transfer, and this is the last one, is radiation. Now, heat radiation is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and it's actually a longer form of radiation than visible light. And when people have no clothes on in a cold environment, actually most of the heat that they lose from the body is actually lost from radiation because all hot bodies, as in the sense of objects, all hot objects radiate heat. So the sun is a hot object and it radiates heat away from it. And remember heat goes from hot areas to cold areas. So if we're in a cold environment and the body is hotter than the environment, then radiation is going to carry heat from the body out into the environment. There's going to be a net loss of radiative heat from the body. So if we're in a cold environment, then heat is going to be lost by radiation from the body. It's actually infrared radiation carrying heat away from the body at the speed of light. So in a cold environment, heat will be lost from the body by radiation into the environment. Now, in a hot environment, when there is hot objects in the environment, or indeed in a very sunny environment, then the body is going to absorb heat, either from radiation from the sun or from radiation from hot objects in the environment. So for example, you might have walked over a very hot footpath and you can feel the heat from that footpath. Now, in a cold environment, clothes are going to reduce the amount of heat that is lost from the surface of the body. Now, in this situation, what we need to remember is that the amount of heat lost by radiation is a function of the surface temperature. So the higher the surface temperature, the more heat is lost by radiation. So if we're not wearing clothes, the surface of the body is relatively warm and a lot of heat will be lost. But if we are wearing clothes, then the surface of our clothes is much cooler than the surface of the body because the surface of the body is insulated by the air and by the clothes themselves. So the clothes are at a lower temperature than the surface of the body 
therefore much less heat is lost from the surface of the clothes as radiation. That's another reason why clothes keep us warm. But again, in the hot environment, if there's a lot of radiation coming from the outside, for example, a very sunny environment, then instead of keeping us warm, clothes can keep us cold. So if we're actually wearing some clothes over the surface of the body, this is why people who work in deserts often wear long flowing robes. People that live in deserts. So if there's clothes over the surface of the body, they're actually going to protect the body underneath from the incoming radiation. Now human skin is actually a fairly good, efficient radiator of heat, regardless of the skin colour. So human skin does radiate heat, so that means we do lose heat through the surface of the skin. And it actually doesn't make much difference what colour the skin is. All human skin is a fairly good radiator of heat. It gives out heat into the environment. Actually, it's interesting to note that uh, black coloured skin um, doesn't absorb radiation of very short wavelength. For example, the type of radiation that comes from the sun. So you normally think that black objects absorb a lot of heat. But in actual fact, people with black skin don't absorb a lot of radiation from the sun not really significantly more than white people do. However, black skin does absorb radiation at longer wavelengths very effectively. And we absorb radiation at longer wavelengths from the environment when the environment's cooler. So actually, it would appear that black skin has got a significant uh, design advantage over, over white skin from that point of view.